none of the potential containers, Penny Morden, Kemi Betanok, or whatever, are terribly widely known by the public. So frankly, the polling that says, how would you vote if X became leader probably isn't worth anything. You then have to make a guess. Do you really think that if, let's say, for the purpose of argument, Penny Mordaunt were to take over in June, that she would be able to so dramatically change the way in which the government run, the image of it in the eyes of the public, the way in which it's sold to the public, that there would be a dramatic turnaround in the opinion polls. It would be a very, very difficult task. Well, no, but nothing is impossible in politics, but certainly anybody who fancies going for the job if Mr. Sunak is brought down would certainly need to be aware that they could end up being an extremely short prime minister indeed. Elections are coming and it doesn't take a crystal ball to understand why many Tory MPs are feeling anxious. Consistently poor polling has got some MPs apparently eyeing up a new leader, but would that actually make a difference? Or could Rishi Sunak be right? Inflation figures out tomorrow, general improvement of the economy. Could that turn things around? Let's speak now to John Curtis, polling expert and professor of politics at Strathclyde University. Morning, John. Good morning, Steve. Um, I mean, you, you'll have been asked this question, you'll have been thinking about this uh, a, a lot, John. The polls are the polls are the polls. They're not shifted. They've not shifted in months and months and months. Is there anything you're seeing that could, could indicate what a lever to move those polls might be? Well, insofar as what one can use the polls to do is to uh, identify what are the things about the state of the nation that appear to be correlated with a reluctance of people to vote Conservative again, um, that certainly gives an indication of you know why the Conservatives are where they are, and therefore what are the things which, if they were to change, might improve matters. Now, if you do that kind of analysis, you get a very clear picture. Uh, item number one, undoubtedly, is the economy. And to that extent, at least, the Prime Minister is quite right in trying to uh, focus on uh, what he thinks is going to be an improving economy and to try to claim credit for it. Um, problem is, of course, it's against the backdrop of four very difficult years, not all of them by any means necessarily the government's fault, but we have been more, more pessimistic and more deeply, uh, consistently pessimistic about the economy over the last four years than we have been in any previous parliament since uh, the relevant question was asked first asked in the late 1970s. Um, but the other problem the government has, which is more difficult for it to overcome, is that once we start arguing about the state of the economy and what's going to happen, et cetera, et cetera all the opposition have to do is to say, Liz Truss, and they're able to pin the blame in the eyes of many voters really? for the we are in on the government. And so even if the economy improves, whether or not the, the government can persuade people, it should be given the credit for the economy is another matter. So anyway, economy is number one. Item number two, which doesn't seem to be on the prime minister's list, but which is also very clearly related to reluctance by 2019 Conservative voters, to vote Conservative again is the state of the National Health Service. Um, and again, one of the reasons why the budget didn't really land terribly well is that it wasn't actually focusing on the public's priorities, which is not the level of taxation, but rather the state of the public services. Um, and to that extent, at least, the government isn't necessarily correctly diagnosing where it needs to take action. So that takes me to my, my third points. What are the things that the government are focusing on which are not necessarily uh, things that uh, matter? Well, what I've already said is tax cuts. The budget has confirmed the message of the autumn statement. Voters are not necessarily going to be bribed by tax cuts. But the other thing that when you start looking to see, well, why are the Tories are where they are? The truth is that immigration doesn't seem to be a central issue. Yeah. And therefore, whether or not, if those flights ever do take off to Rwanda this side of election, whether that also is going to make any difference. Well, shall we say there is there are there is there are reasonable grounds for being doubtful that that will prove to be the case. It's the economy and it's the NHS that the government has to try to focus on to improve and more difficultly to try and claim the credit for. Which takes me on to point four in this list, which wasn't there, but I want to put it there. Uh, John, would if would would changing the leader make any difference? If it was if it was Penny Mordaunt, or I, mean, I can't even think of else it might be, uh, making the same case with the same historical context, with the same grim shadow of Liz Truss 
hovering behind them. Would that make any difference? Well, certainly, if you regard Rishi Sunak as the model, the answer to that question is no, because when Mr Sunak first became prime minister, he was much less unpopular than his party. But we're now in a situation where his party is just as unpopular as it was, but he is now as, is as unpopular as his party. So the question is, is there somebody there who can pull off a trick that Mr Sunak couldn't pull off? Now, leadership is undoubtedly a problem for the Conservative Party. It's the other big legacy of this parliament. The fact that they have ditched two mm -hmm. leaders both of whom one uh, because of ethics of his leadership the other over her competence um you know that is very difficult for the conservatives to escape and there is a risk that if they dump yet another one voters will just conclude these guys really cannot provide us with an effective prime minister that said of course well i mean the first thing to say is there isn't any none of the potential contenders penny morden kemi betanock or whatever are terribly widely known by the public so frankly, the polling that says, how would you vote if X became leader probably isn't worth anything. You then have to make a guess. Do you really think that if, let's say for the purposes of argument, Penny Mordaunt were to take over in June, that she would be able to so dramatically change the way in which the government run, the image of it in the eyes of the public, the way in which it's sold to the public, that there would be a dramatic turnaround in the opinion polls. It would be a very, very difficult task. Well, no, but nothing is impossible in politics, but certainly anybody who fancies going for the job if Mr Sonek is brought down would certainly need to be aware that they could end up being an extremely short prime minister indeed. Yeah, well, well on this, uh, on that point, then just finally, we had Jacob rees mogg on, and he said it was really interested in hearing your thoughts on, because he, he basically said this, that how much surprises... How many surprises are there in politics? He said there was a surprise in 2017. There was a surprise in 2019 after the, the poor um, um, uh, uh, European election. Anyway, he, he asked you a question. Let's hear it. I'd be very interested to hear John Kersey's view on this. Um, things have changed before. So the 2017 election, Theresa May went into it with a phenomenal lead way ahead of Jeremy Corbyn, and that changed during the course of the campaign. Mm. And in 2019, the Tories had their worst election result ever in the European elections, and then won an election um, seven months later. So to what extent can things change? To what extent is any improvement in the economy going to be beneficial? And to what extent will people look at Keir Starmer and say, well, that's not exactly who we want? You've answered some of those questions already. I guess the question is, how much is change possible, um, John? Well, the answer to is, that, of course, you can't rule out anything in politics. And I think uh, Jacob Rees-Mark is certainly right that while the public seem to be disenchanted with the current government, they have not necessarily got a great deal of enthusiasm for the opposition. It's just at the moment that the disgruntlement with the government seems to outweigh whatever doubts uh, many people have about the opposition. But I think the point is, let, let's, let, let's Jacob Rees, Morgan and I agree on one thing. Something rather dramatic needs to turn up for things to be turned around. Uh, I think, to be honest, some of us felt that when Theresa May went for 2017, she was taking a risk um, and uh, that risk proved, uh, proved to be manifest. Uh, by the time the election was called in 2019, it was clear that the Conservatives were in a much stronger position than he quite rightly points out that they were in uh, the previous spring. But by then, you know, they had they had taken on board uh, uh, Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson had supposedly renegotiated the Brexit deal and he then succeeded in flattening uh, the challenge from Brexit. One, of course, the difficulties that the government has this time uh, in contrast to 2019, is that the, the successor to the Brexit Party reform under Richard Tice's leadership is determined, seeming determined to fight every single Conservative MP for their seat. And that's one of the many reasons yeah. as to why this election looks so much more difficult for the Conservatives than any of the three yeah. previous contests that they did indeed manage to win. Uh, that's a very fair point. John, great to speak to you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, that's John Curtis there, polling expert, Professor of Politics at Strathclyde University. They had Brexit in 2019. Is there anything analogous in 2024?